<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's me again. Um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, here in the UK. Um, and thank you for uh, uh, tuning in again online. Um, my name is Tony Allen. I'm Chief Executive of the Age Check Certification Scheme. And I think um, one of the things that I'm planning to sort of do today is talk you through um, a little bit of the journey that we've been going on when it comes to looking at the issue of how you go about measuring the efficiency, uh, efficacy of age assurance systems. Um, and it's a, a journey of discovery and it's a journey that is continuing to discover and it's a journey that we have not yet reached I would say a settled way of how to do it we were really pleased earlier on to be hearing from NIST and the results of their face age um, technology um, uh, sort of Patrick's just joined us back in the room um, and, and he in his presentation he was talking about some real challenges with things like um, uh, the Fitzpatrick scale, for instance, and uh, and, and the, the facial um, uh, skin tone bias, and other challenges in relation to uh, how you actually go about analysing and measuring that. So this has been a, a task that's been going on for a a little while. So as a part of that, and as a part of the uh, uh, the work we were doing, we were we were commissioned uh, initially by the ICO and then uh, subsequently by Ofcom and the ICO uh, uh, acting together in partnership to just look at the overall measurement of age assurance technology. And this, this resulted in two reports which were published here in the UK by the Digital Regulation Corporation Forum. And uh, the first one really looked at the, the kind of techniques of measurement and, uh, and how you go about looking at um, uh, the statistical analysis. And I'm gonna, uh, my friend and colleague here, uh, Lindsay McCall, who is the, stat the, the chartered statistician who worked on this uh, project, is going to talk more about the, uh, the statistical side of it. And then we went on to look at, okay, well, if we look at those measurements, what's the kind of level of performance that exists in the marketplace as of, well, when we did this uh, nearly a year ago, as of last year, um, at a kind of fairly um, broad level um, and really looking at in um, in in uh, uh, legal terms, the, the 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 term state of the art, which means something different to what it means to a marketeer. Um, so when you're in marketing, people say, "Well, this is state of the art. It's the best of the best. It's it's as best as you can possibly be." In legal terms, when it comes to that in GDPR, what it means is that it's moved a bit beyond somebody's bright idea or theory or or piece of academic research into a stage of production not necessarily into general use across technology yet, but it's moved beyond an idea. It's, it's, it's actually in production and it's, it's, in, it's in use. And there's a, there's a specific legal definition of state of the art in relation to uh, EU's uh, GDPR. So we looked at and explored that um, as part of the project. And we had a load of workshops and a load of discussion and a load of um, analysis of that and came up with um, these two reports. Well, at first, we know what the we know what the scale of problem is. Um, basically, uh, it, yeah, of course, I'm over eighteen. Just tick the box, and that is uh, really the, the challenge that we are we are seeking to uh, uh, to address. So, a little bit about um, uh, our um, approach to this. So, the first thing is that a lot of the um, approaches to measurements and a lot of the approaches to uh, face recognition, to biometric analysis, to uh, presentation attack detection. Uh, to document checking, to other things, are anchored in identity assurance. Um, there is a lot of uh, uh, standards out there in relation to identity assurance. There's a lot of, um, uh, there's some that are relatively uh, uh, well established now. Uh, 29115 has been around for 12, 11, 12 years. Uh, there are a lot of developments of areas of that. And of course, we could use those standards, and indeed we do use those standards as, as being um, analogous in some ways, but there is a critical difference between identity assurance and age assurance. And that is you don't need to know who I am in order to tell how old I am. So you don't need to be measuring me against an enrolled data set. You don't need, you don't need to be seeing, am I this person that was previously this person? Am I this person that opened this bank account and is now coming back to use this bank account? Am I this person that applied for this driving license and still is the holder of this driving license. That's all 
very important stuff, but related to identity assurance. With age assurance, you don't need to do that. You can look at me right now and you can say, if it is you that wishes to go ahead and gamble, can I do analysis, biometric analysis of you? Um, and it can be face, it can be voice, it can be uh, hand geometry, it can be uh, sociographs, it can be use of email, it can be all sorts of things. How can um, you uh, assess me as being old enough to be able to go ahead and do that, uh, use that service? And then that brings in an entirely different field of measurement and analysis, an entirely different field of statistical um, uh, research. So I use this as an example. I brought some with me. Where did we, where, when we were looking at this, where on earth did we start? And the reason why I bring this with me is because this is a bag of peas. In fact, it's a bag of peas and carrots. Um, and it says on it, it's 750 grams of peas and carrots. Right? There might be 750 grams of peas and carrots in there. But there could legally be anything between 735 grams and 765 grams of peas and carrots in there. So you may well be buying less peas and carrots than you're paying for in this bag of peas. And in Europe, and in fact, largely around the world now, there is a symbol uh, on the back of your set of peas here, which says 750 grams. It's got an E next to it, which stands for estimated. So that legally, um, companies are only required to estimate the number of peas and carrots there are in this bag. And they can sell that to you and still describe it as 750 grams. The science that sits behind that is that overall, you buy lots of bags of peas and carrots, the number of times that you get not enough versus the number of times you get too many will balance out. So over the course of your lifetime, you will get enough peas and carrots. This is a, 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 a theories of science around errors, absolute errors, mean absolute errors, and um, uh, ensuring that in, a, in packers, in the packers rules, um, that you have these are the symbols, the E's on the on the they're on every almost every product that you buy, you will find this symbol on the side of the product, which is which is telling you that there's only nearly or maybe that amount in there, not the actual amount. And it comes from these rules: the average quantity of a batch should not be less than the nominal quantity stated on the label. No more than one in forty packages have a negative error greater than the tolerable error, the tolerable negative error, and none of the packages have a neg negative error greater than twice the tolerable negative error. So you're not allowed to, so with a packet of peas there, it can be anything from, um, for 750 grams, anything from 735 grams. So the tolerable error is 15 grams. At double the tolerable error is 30 grams. So if there's anything less than 720 grams in that packet, you're breaking the law and you can be fined and prosecuted uh, for that. Um, but you're allowed those tolerances. And we sort of took that theory in the world of age estimation and the science behind that and applied the theory of that to how you estimate somebody's age and applying levels of tolerance, applying the, 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 the science of uh, allow, an allowable level um, and, and having um, a, a sort of one in 40, which um, if anyone you know about the standard deviation and curves like that is, is, is one end of the standard deviation um, bell curve uh, being allowed outside a certain error and then none of them being allowed outside double of that error. And we fed this into the research, we fed this into the analysis and we fed the mean absolute errors, the uh, true positive rates, the standard deviations and the other acceptable uh, uh, measures and that we uh, identified. And then we looked at how you would then describe that. Can we come up with an E symbol that you stick on the side of an age assurance suit? Can you, can you come up with a way that you could um, easily identify and tell what the level of um, uh, confidence and, and knowledge there was about what was in the age estimation uh, uh, kit that you are, you are using? And how could you come up with some simple rules how could you come up with some simple tolerances and how could you come up with some simple explainers? We're trying, we, were, we, we have been trying to boil this down from lots and lots of statistical theory into something which is easy to grapple with for the public, for confidence and for assurance, for regulators, for understanding what they're, um, they're applying and what they're, they're regulating and for the marketing for the point of view of dis displaying, displaying and describing one product with another. 
Uh, so you can um, say that you know ours is the best one that does this if you can uh, simply explain that and simply um, apply that. And that's led us into the development of uh, these international standards, which we're hearing a lot about uh, today. Uh, a little bit of an update on this in the in the course of the morning, since I wrote these slides the other day, is that the uh, the, the the proposal is that actually the last two, uh, part two and part three, get swapped around. Um, so that part one will be the framework, part two will be technical architecture and guidelines for use, and part three will be benchmarking, and it makes more of a logical flow to, uh, to, to do that. But it, in doing that, we have included in the draft of, of uh, the benchmarking report a lot of this statistical theory, which you're going to hear more about from, uh, from, from Lindsay. And now I think where we're up to with drafting that standard is we now to need to do more applied theory from that so how it applies to age estimation so looking at all the multitude of different methodologies there are in different uh, uh, statistical analysis how do we boil that down into being able to describe a clear set of rules around what there is in a bag of mixed vegetables we've also got the ieee standard and the eu consent work which i gave a presentation about earlier on um, this morning So we started with it. Well, we didn't start with this, actually. We, we kind of got to this point um, where you have these kind of five indicators of confidence. We kind of boiled it down quite a bit. There's a lot of argument about whether we boiled it down too far. There's a lot of argument about whether these are actually useful. There's a lot of argument about what they should be set at or they, whether they should ever be set at all. But what the uh, feedback from the uh, from regulators and from markets and uh, from industry is what they want to be able to do when they're uh, determining policy or they're, they're, uh, they're, they're um, uh, setting uh, expectations or, or challenges to the marketplace is to say for this particular use case or this particular um, scenario uh, we uh, believe that for uh, the risk associated with this uh, we should be achieving something like an enhanced level of, um, of assurance or level of confidence in the age assurance techniques that are deployed. What that potentially enables you to be able to do then is to say it doesn't matter what you do in terms of the type of modality. It doesn't matter whether you're doing driving license checks or you're doing face age estimation or voice age estimation. If they can achieve the characteristics of a, an enhanced check, they will be comparable with each other. So you can create a mark that you can uh, boost the marketplace and you can create a choice for um, uh, providers of uh, services that are age restricted to be able to pick and choose what will work best in their use case and in their scenario you're not being you're not saying well you've got to do um, a, a, an id check and you've got to do it with a passport or a driving license you're, uh, because regulators don't generally want to be that prescriptive they want to allow for uh, the development of innovation, they want to allow for creativity, they want to allow for new technologies, they want to allow for improvements and uh, the benefits of those improvements. So at a very high level, that's the theory of this. And I think the discussion that went on this morning with the uh, ISO group is that there is broad um, uh, uh, agreement that the theory of this is fine, that you have some sort of label. There is some disagreement, I have to say, I'm not, it's not uh, uh, by any means yet reached a consensus. But the theory of it is fine. The problem is how you then define the characteristics that go with each of those buckets or each of those labels. So where would you set them? And in the draft document that's been circulated and is around on a place, you'll see that it has these uh, four. And people say that's a bit high. Uh, can anything actually achieve that? Can anything actually get to those those kind of levels of, um, uh, uh, of analysis? And some modalities may well be able to. Um, but uh, generally speaking across the marketplace they might not um, achieve those but then you've got to say actually is that enough as is that too simplified have we have we broken it down to a point where honestly we're, we're just trying to call that an apple and not worried about the brand of apple not worried about the type of apple not worried about where the apples come from or they were just to say that's an apple um, do we need secondary information do we need to have information that will um, uh, provide for things like the mean absolute error or the standard deviation or the false negative rates or false positive rates. A lot of these measures are quite widely used uh, in, in the age uh, assurance industry. 
they're almost all being used in sometimes in in competing ways sometimes in different ways but they're also not really hitting the nail on the head in a lot of cases so mean absolute error tells you some things but doesn't tell you a lot of things um, standard deviation tells you bits about the spread of the errors but doesn't tell you about the necessarily that much about the spread of um, noise either side of an in individual um, error so it these are all kind of measures that could be useful and could give you an overview picture, but they're not necessarily hitting the nail exactly on the head when it comes to what you need to be able to, to, to measure. And I was really interested to hear Patrick earlier on talking about the challenges that NIST have faced when they've come to an, analyze some of these and, and exactly, um, exactly whether they are valuable as measures or not. So there's a bit of a, work, uh, a bit of work going on about whether or not it would be better if we went for a, um, a slightly lower classification accuracy, um, uh, 80, 95 percent, 99 percent, 99.9 percent. Very interestingly, um, a, a number of legislatures um, and, uh, and regulators around the world are starting to set classification accuracy um, levels. Utah, for instance, has recently passed a law that sets it at 95 percent. When I asked them why 95 percent, they said it seemed like about the right amount. That was the level of uh, analysis they'd put into it. Fair enough. Uh, ultimately, the, the point that lies behind that is, to some extent, it doesn't really matter where you set the levels. But the fact that there are levels there that make things comparable across a marketplace is more important than what the levels actually are. But the levels should at least be achievable. There's no point in setting something that is, is unachievable. And of course, the other problem is that they'll always get better. And they'll always, uh, you know, uh, technology will move on. Uh, if any of you, uh, again, here in the European Union, if any of you bought a, uh, a fridge or a fridge freezer, uh, white goods, about five or six years ago, you suddenly discovered that all of the A-rated fridges suddenly dropped to E-rating because the European Commission moved the goalposts on what was an A-rated fridge. Because basically, when they first did it, everyone came out and went, oh yeah, if we do this and tweak it here and there, we can hit those A-ratings, no problem at all. So everybody did. So overnight all the fridges became a rated and the european well that's no use is that we need we need a graduation scale here so they changed all the rules to change all the graduations and every every a rated fridge suddenly became an e-rated fridge for energy efficiency um, stuff so you've got that problem if you set a benchmark if you set a, a particular level you've got the problem that we may look at this in in uh, in five years time and every single one of the age verification and age assurance measures out there easily hits 99.9 percent .9 classification accuracy, in which case the utility of having a graduated scheme would become less useful. So you've got to bear that in mind. So we started this, we, we, we kind of looked at what you might um, uh, need in there, we've developed it, it's still developing, there is still lots of uh, queries and, uh, and discussion going on about it. This week is a fantastic opportunity for everybody here, everybody online, everybody in the room here to throw your thoughts into the ring. Um, uh, what I will say about the, um, the, 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 the benefit of um, uh, standards development necessarily over, the, ne over regulatory development is often when you've got regulatory development, it is uh, a, a government agency, a civil service um, uh, that are consulting and they, and they, they do what they're going to do, but you're basically throwing your thoughts in. And you might get listened to, you might get... Um, you might get somewhere, but often it's just the civil service doing what ministers or, or politicians uh, want to do. The difference with standards is, is, is that what you say really does matter, what you contribute really does matter. You will often find when you're contributing to standards that the exact words that you say turn up in those standards if they're good and they're worthwhile and they achieve consensus across views. And not often you can say that about, uh, about regulation. Occasionally you can with regulation where you, you suddenly see something in, in a regulation you think, I know who sent that and I know what the email was uh, where <laughs> it appears. So do get, in, do get in touch, do contribute. You've got the whole of this week to, uh, to throw things in. They will all be uh, assimilated and listened to and they will be part of uh, the uh, UK's um, analysis of this as it goes forward through the standards. So I've given you kind of the overview of the research. I'm going to hand over to Lindsay who is going to uh, talk you through a bit more of the detailed uh, statistical analysis that was behind that. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so as Tony said, um, I'm just going to go through a little bit more in detail about the te technical aspects of the research that we did. 
Um, so there were two parts to the research. And the first one, we were focusing on measurements of accuracy. And then the second part, I would very much say we were looking at refining the approach. We um, very much took the work that we had done. We had stakeholder workshops and we had a lot of feedback and we had technical working groups and we were able to sort of hone in on what we had done in the first part and really refine it. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, talk about age estimation technologies in particular and finally testing considerations. So um, measurements of accuracy. So um, we started off um, thinking about what we meant by um, age assurance, which I know there's been a lot of conversation this week about the definition of age assurance, but this idea of being able to estimate um, somebody's age or looking at their um, whether their age is greater than less than a threshold, for example. And we looked at age assurance according to two types, age estimation, where you're actually estimating the age of an individual, and age verification, where you're looking at um, whether or not um, they um, are greater than or less than an age threshold, so for example, 18. And then we thought of a more about measurement of accuracy, and we sort of said that there were four pillars to this idea, so efficacy, equality, comparability, and repeatability. Um, so just go into those in a little bit more detail. So efficacy, I realize, is um, multifaceted in this area. And so um, you know, there's lots of different things, like presentation attack, et cetera, to take into account. But here, I just wanted to focus on um, you know, has age estimation verification been performed to a satisfactory degree? How accurate is the age assurance technology? So um, essentially, how you know is 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 the age age assurance technology getting it right? Um, and when we looked into this again, we focused on these two types: age estimation and age verification. So age estimation being measures applicable to continuous outcomes because we're thinking about ages, um, and measures applicable to binary outcomes because we're thinking about age verification, which is like is somebody over eighteen? Yes or no. Um, and then I guess the question, what is a satisfactory degree in terms of getting it right? Well, that is definitely a regulatory um, question and something that clearly there's a lot of discussion about this week. Equality is obviously a hugely important one, and we saw that in Patrick's presentation earlier for NIST. We want to ensure technologies treat different people fairly and equally with respect to their protective characteristics. Um, often there isn't a single definition of fair fairness and assessments could include lots of different things. So we could think about anti-classification, the idea, obviously with age assurance technologies, we're estimating someone's age, but you know, you, you, you probably, you know, so it's the idea of not using other protective characteristics to estimate somebody's age. Um, classification or outcome error parity, and that's something very much that we're focusing on. And the idea is, are your error rates, do they differ between genders? Do they differ between skin tones? And obviously, again, from the um, um, presentation earlier, we could see that there are different error rates in technologies. And then also we can think about calibration. Um, how well do your models calibrate um, across different protected characteristics? Um, comparability, this is the idea that we want to be able to come up with something that is comparable across different types of technology. As Tony said, you know, age estimation is only one. We want to think about measures um, and we want to think about testing that, you know, where we can think about, you know, how well does an age estimation technology do across different age estimation technologies, but we also want to think about how does that do compared to a voice recognition technology, for example. And repeatability, which is essentially thinking about the precision. Um, so we want to, so repeatability is a fundamental principle of testing protocols. A test that isn't repeatable will undermine the confidence in the test laboratory and, limit, and has implications for accreditation. So in the first part, you know, we sort of put some more details around these four pillars and we came up with um, lots of potential metrics that you could use to assess the accuracy of age estimation and age verification technologies. Um, and then what we wanted to do in the second part of the research was go out and really talk to stakeholders. So we talked to regulators and we talked to people who are developing age assurance technologies. And we had workshops to talk about the different approaches and we got quite a lot of feedback, which was really helpful and really useful. I have to say the workshops were a really, it, it feels similar to this week in lots of ways. Getting lots of people around the table was hugely helpful. 
So I think the first consensus from the te technical workshops was, you know, previously we very much put this emphasis um, against age estimation and age verification, but at the end of the day, when you're deploying an age assurance technology, irrespective of whether it's estimation or verification, you will result in a binary outcome. The way it's being deployed is to identify whether you are, for example, over or under 18. So then we said, well, okay, so we need to know what the age gate is. So the age or age range that is of interest to the relying party where an age-related eligibility decision is required. Um, and then the technologies can be assessed according to their stated age gate. So, you know, um, whilst, you know, quite often we focus on this idea of being over or under 18, um, it could also be um, age ranges. So, for example, between 13 and 16, where you've got like a safe space for teenagers. So just to go into a bit more detail, there are three different age gate scenarios to consider potentially when we're thinking about testing age assurance technologies. So over an age threshold to stop access to age inappropriate products, under an age threshold to access safe places where no adults are allowed for safeguarding issues, and then between one specified age and another. So for example, the ICO's children's code, they have different age ranges, um, like core primary school years or preteen years, they might be of interest. When we think about these different scenarios, we want to um, think about the implications of an incorrect classification. So really what we want to do is we want to minimize false positives. Um, so we want to minimize people being incorrectly classified in a way that's going to cause harm. So in the first scenario, our false positives are gonna be those who are under the age threshold. Um, so for example, if they're under 18 and they're incorrectly classified as being over 18 and they're allowed into age inappropriate content. In scenario two, our false positives would be those people who are over the age threshold and are incorrectly classified as under it, meaning that you're essentially allowing an adult access to a safe space, causing safeguarding issues. And in scenario three, your false positives are going to be those outside of the age range, incorrectly classified as within it. So again, the idea is, is that, you know, all errors are wrong, but, but really, you know, false positives are the ones that are going to cause harm. And so they're often the ones that we might want to focus on more. Of course, um, false negatives are also problematic because it, it's going to cause more friction to people because they're going to potentially have to go through another age verification step. And you do have to weight the two types of errors. But um, typically, we would um, focus on false positives because of the harm that could cause. So the measures that we've been looking at, um, so if we're going to focus on scenario one, so a person is identified over the age threshold or under it, um, where over is positive and under is negative, the measures that we've come up with are all based around what we would call um, a confusion matrix. Um, I don't know if I've got a pointer. I don't think I do. Okay, but anyway, um, so basically what you've got um, on the left-hand side of the matrix is what you observe, what your truth is. So either you are over 18 or you're under 18. And across the top, you've got what your age assurance um, has um, predicted you to be is whether you're over 18 or under 18. And so what you've got is you've got your true positives, which are in the, um, in the top left and the bottom right, the true positives and the true negatives. So that's where you correctly classified. And in the opposite direction, you've got your false positives and your false negatives. That's where you've incorrectly classified so your false positives are people who are under 18 but have been identified as over 18 and your false negatives are those who are over 18 but have been identified as under. Okay, so we can, you can come up with lots of different metrics here associated with this. You can have your overall accuracy, which is effectively um, the percentage of your um, test subjects that are correctly classified. You can have your true positive rate or your sensitivity. So that's saying of all those people who are over 18, what's the proportion that are, have been predicted are correctly classified as being over 18. You've got your true negative rate or your specificity. So again, of all those people who are under 18, what's the proportion that were correctly classified as being under 18? And then, as I said before, probably maximizing your true negative rate and minimizing your false positive rate could be a priority because of the idea of harm. But of course, you have to weight the two types of errors. And then finally, you've got your things like your predictive values. So in, in the previous ones, what we're saying is given what we've observed, what's the proportion that are correct? 
but actually when you're going to use a technology you don't know you don't know the age of that user and so the positive predictive value say it can say if my technology says that i'm over 18 what's the probability like what's the percentage of people that are going to be over 18 so as Tony mentioned, there is quite a lot of emphasis on the idea of having one primary measure that was simple and easy to communicate. And um, in the research, um, overall accuracy was deemed to be that sort of idea, a simple metric that gave an overall measure of classification accuracy and was easy to understand for non-technical audiences. And as Tony's already mentioned, it was there was the idea that we could align the primary measures to indicators of confidence. Um, I think that it's really important to note that there are um, so whilst that, that, that is a primary overall classification accuracy, as Tony mentioned, um, it doesn't tell you the whole picture. There's two things I think that's important to understand with overall accuracy. So one, um, it can be misleading if you've got imbalanced data sets, um, which we can talk about slightly later. And then secondly, it doesn't tell you anything really about the errors. So what kind of errors are you getting? Are you getting false positives? Or are you getting false negatives? And that's really why we think that you need a, um, a set of secondary measures to be reported in conjunction. I don't think that any of these errors on their own are sufficient. I think that we need to understand um, a number of different measures. So your true positive rate, your false positive rate, your mean absolute error to build up a picture of how well your technology is doing. And so you can better um, balance out the risks and benefits of deploying the technology. Um, so we, when we talked about this, do you know what time it is? Yeah. Um, we talked about this with our technical working group um, and, and about this idea of about having overall accuracy in these different tolerance levels. And the um, feedback from the age estimation technologies was that um, at the end, at the, that achieving a certain level of classification accuracy would always be very difficult for them particularly for ages that is close to that age threshold. If you've got somebody who's 17 or somebody who's 19, it's going to be very difficult to correctly um, um, assign them. And so um, what they felt was that it made more sense to, um, that they wouldn't be used in isolation and it would be more fair to look at that the way that they are actually deployed. And it's more, per, you know, so basically we were saying, they said that we would use it within a challenge age setting. So I think we've seen similar diagrams before but the idea is so we've used challenge age 25 because that's what's used most widely in the uk but obviously um your challenge age could vary um but if we're interested in identifying somebody is over 18 we'd set the challenge age at 25 so if we say we're confident that you're over 25 then we're definitely confident you're over 18 but if we are not confident that we're over 25 then you go on to your secondary age verification method um, and then basically what you could do is either evaluate the accuracy of the combined gateways although in reality the practicalities of that are unlikely and so really it's more that we would provide additional secondary measures based on the challenge age so you'd want to sort of um, to effectively measure um, the accuracy of how the um, technology was being deployed in practice. And finally, I just wanted to go through some of the testing considerations. So I think that when we go about um, with this idea of testing technologies to certify them, there are lots of different considerations. And I think these are the sorts of considerations that will be added into the ISO. Um, so, you know, having appropriate test protocols, test subjects, which is, a, I know, a huge issue in, in, its, in itself. How do we build um, a test data set with the appropriate number of subjects that are representative. Um, you know, we know that we need people who are under 18 in those test sets, but there's all sorts of ethics associated with that. There are environmental considerations, cap different types of capture devices, but there's also um, some statistical considerations, including things like the design of the test and the sample size, and that's the sort of area that I just wanted to finish on there. I think if we're testing a, um, a technology, then we need to test it in the way that it's going to be deployed. So the test needs to be designed to ensure that it appropriately reflects its deployment. Otherwise, all of those accuracy measures that I've just discussed will effectively be meaningless. Um, so for example, if a technology is deployed to ensure participants are over an age threshold, then we need to start thinking about what age range should the test subjects be made up of. 
what are the breakdown of the test subjects? They need to be representative of age, but they also need to be representative of gender and skin tone. And we also want to be able to break down our errors associated with those different protected characteristics. Um, is our test um, data sets, are they balanced? Um, well, how many samples do we need to reliably assess the accuracy and use these different performance metrics? So it's just to, finalize, to, to say finally, designing the test is really as important as the measures we use to assess the results. And it's something that really needs to be considered carefully by regulators because otherwise, you know, we could be producing all sorts of answers to these metrics, but in reality, we don't exactly, we wouldn't know what they meant. Okay, questions? Put the uh, general slide back up if you want. Uh, so, uh, any questions? Anyone got any uh, queries they want to, to raise with us? Anything online? I think we've stunned them into silence. <laughs> or, oh, sorry, here we You might need a microphone because I can't hear you. Um, can't hear you online if you haven't got a microphone. No, but it's, people online can't hear if, if, they, if you haven't got a microphone. Um, you said this was commissioned by the IOF Common and the ICO. I just wondered um, what stage you were at. Have you reported back? If you had it, how, how was it received? I just wondered where you are with all this. Yeah, absolutely. It's publicly available. It's, it was published um, uh, um, actually last year. Um, by the, it's on the digital regulation, digital regulation cooperation forums website, and it's also on both ICO and Ofcom's website and on ours as well. Um, uh, it was received. Obviously, as anyone will know, has ever done any work for government, it's uh, it goes through quite a process to be checked and assessed by lawyers and uh, by um, uh, specialists and the technical team. Um, so they, they, you know, we got to a point where they were happy to to publish it. Um, it is um, a, a piece of research that's helped to inform particularly the development of the guidance under the, on, off, uh, under the Online Safety Act 2023 in the UK. Um, and it's also helped to inform the update of the Information Commissioner's official opinion of age assurance, um, uh, which was issued uh, in October. So it's, it, it's, it's not of itself a, an official document, but it has been used to uh, inform uh, other documents that have, been, that have been put out there. But it is all publicly available and, uh, and free to access. I can get the links for you as well if you need them. Anybody else? No, fantastic. Thank you. Nick. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, round of applause, please. For, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>